subject to feedback in the academy for yet another session. Thank you, Dr. Sir, for inviting me. And uh, of course, interactions like these definitely helps all of us in uh, trying to find a solution in one of the other practical problems that we encounter almost daily in our day-to-day -day practice when we sit in the box. And uh, I think this is a good forum where we can, of course, discuss. Without wasting much time, let's begin with the first session. And the first session for the day uh, would be about consumptions. Consumptions in the sense um, we all know that in almost all civil matters, when the case is filed, and even if it is the advocate's chamber, the question of exemption normally arises when it comes to property. And there is an application, mostly, along with the plea for an exemption. It could be for temporary exemption. Or it could be under the specific relief act as well for a perpetual injunction. Or sometimes it could be for mandatory injunction as well. So the concept of temporary injunction, perpetual injunction, or mandatory injunction, most of you are already, I mean, all of you are already aware, I will not go into what it is or how it is done. But with reference to the specific relief act, or superannuation, or the court is that. And uh, what happens when these injunction orders are not obeyed? Or what if there is a, a violation of the injunction order? What are the steps or remedies that the opposite party, or normally it's the plaintiff, that is showing the injunction, uh, sorry, for whom, or in, his, on the, on his, in whose favor, the injunction order is issued, if there is a violation by the defendant, what are the remedies available to the plaintiff? And as of what, what we can do. And you know, you all know that injunction mostly depends on equity. So it is an equitable remedy. And everybody or anybody that wants an injunction has to come hands. In these words is just an introductory, uh, introductory to the session that will be <coughs> taken up. I'd like to request none other than uh, our civil judge competition as to Ganto, Ms. Gordon Dai, to please come up and uh, begin the presentation. Rule 32 of the CPC deal with injunction. 
and if injunction is an equitable remedy given by courts of justice, that requires a party to do or to refrain from doing certain acts. A failure to comply with the injunction results in either criminal or civil penalties in the form of payment of damages or acceptance of sanctions. <coughs> the types of uh, injunction are preliminary injunction, preventive injunction, mandatory, temporal, uh, temporary and permanent. Preliminary injunction, is, which is also known as ad interim injunction, is passed in favor of a plaintiff before trial and even before appearance of the defendant. <coughs> a preliminary injunction preserves the subject matter in its existing condition to protect the plaintiff's rights so that the purpose of the suit is not defeated. Preventive injunction is an order that directs an individual to abstain from doing a certain act. It is preventive, prohibitive, or negative in nature. The purpose is to prevent an impending injury likely to be caused, inflicted by the defendant, to preserve the status quo and quiet the continued commission of the ongoing wrong. Temporary injunction order. As per Section 37 of the Specific Act, uh, <coughs> temporary injunctions are such as uh, to continue until a specified time or until the court, for the order of the court, and they may be granted at any stage of a suit and are regulated by the CPC. Order 39 of the CPC deals with temporary injunction. The court grants it to preserve the status quo of the subject of the contro controversy until the giving of an application for a temporary injunction. Through it, it also seeks to prevent any instance of unnecessary and irreparable injury. Uh, this, uh, in M. Gurudas and others, AI 2006, SC 3275, the Honorable Supreme Court ruled that an application for an injunction ought to be evaluated on the basis of three factors. That is, the case's privacy legality, the balance of convenience, and irreparable harm. In Satya Prakash and another, versus first additional district judge, ETA, AR 2002, Allahabad 202, the Honorable Allahabad High Court <coughs> held that by irreparable injury, it is not meant that there must be no physical possibility of repairing the injury. All that is meant is that the injury would be a material one and which could not be adequately remedied by damages in terms of money. Perpetual injunction. A permanent injunction order is passed at the time of final judgment, granting a final relief to the applicant. Once the permanent injunction order is passed, the temporary injunction order automatically ceases to be enforced. Section 37, subsection 2 of the Specific Relief Act deals with perpetual injunctions. A perpetual injunction can only be granted by the decree made at the hearing and upon the merits of the suit. <coughs> the defendant is thereby perpetually enjoined from the assertion of a right or from the commission of an act which would be contrary to the rights of the plaintiff. Circumstances when perpetual injunction can be granted is laid down by section 38 of the Specific Relief Act to prevent the breach of an obligation existing in favor, whether expressly or by implication, when the defendant invades or threatens to invade the plaintiff's right or enjoyment of property, <coughs> the court may grant a perpetual injunction in the following cases. Namely, where the defendant is a trustee for property for the plaintiff, where there exists no standard for ascertaining the actual damage caused or likely to be caused by the invasion, <coughs> where the invasion is such that compensation in money would not afford adequate relief, and where the injunction is necessary to prevent a multiplicity of judicial proceedings. A mandatory injunction. A mandatory injunction directs the defendant to perform a certain act. It is the most rigorous of all the injunctions. For example, an order directing that a defendant remove a building or structure upon a large land which does not belong to him or to remove himself and his belongings from the suit property, therefore the court must exercise caution while passing such an order. Section 39 of the Specific Relief Act deals with mandatory injunction, which says, when to prevent the breach of an obligation, it is necessary to compare the performance of certain acts which the court is capable of enforcing, the court may, in its discretion, <coughs> grant an injunction to prevent the breach complained of and also to compel performance of the requisite acts. Uh, 
there are two types of mandatory injunctions. One is restorative and enforcing. Restorative pertains to the restoration of the status quo by compelling the defendant to undertake a specific action. And enforcing involves the performance of a positive act, typically on a continuous basis. In the case of Redland Briggs versus Morris, it was held <clears throat> that the grant of a mandatory injunction is contingent upon the plaintiff's ability to demonstrate a high likelihood based on factual evidence that significant harm will be inflicted upon them in the future. The exercise of jurisdiction should be done with respect and careful consideration, but when appropriate, it should be done without hesitation. Circumstances when injunction ought to be refused is provided by Section 14 of the Specific Bill Act, <coughs> it says that the injunction cannot be granted to restrain any person from prosecuting a judicial proceeding pending at the institution of the suit in which the injunction is sought, unless such restraint is necessary to prevent multiplicity of proceedings, to restrain any person from instituting or prosecuting any proceeding in a court not subordinate to that from which the injunction is sought, to restrain any person from applying to any legislative body, to restrain any person from instituting or prosecuting any proceeding in a criminal matter, to prevent the breach of, breach of a contract, the performance of which would not be specifically enforced, to prevent on the ground of nuisance an act of which it is not reasonably clear that it will be a nuisance, to prevent a continuing breach in which the plaintiff has acquiesced. When equally efficacious, relief can, be, uh, <coughs> can certainly be obtained by any other usual mode of proceeding except in the case of breach of trust. When the conduct of the plaintiff or his agents has been such as to disentitle him to the assistance of the court, and when the plaintiff has no personal interest in the matter. Uh, Section 40 of the Specific Relief Act deals with the damages in lieu of or in addition to an injunction. It says, uh, the plaintiff in a suit for perpetual injunction under Section 38 or mandatory injunction under Section 39 may claim da damages either in addition to or in substitution for such injunction and the court may, if it thinks, award such damages. No relief for damages shall be granted under this section unless the plaintiff has claimed such relief in his plaint, provided that when no su such damages has been claimed in the plaint, the court shall at any stage of the proceedings allow the plaintiff to amend the claim in such terms as may be just for the, or including such a claim. The dismissal of a suit to prevent the breach of an obligation uh, existing in favor of the plaintiff shall bar his right to sue for damages for such breach. Section 42 of the Specific Act deals with injunction to perform negative agreement. Uh, now coming to <coughs> violation of injunction order. Rule 2, capital A of Order 39 of the CPC deals with the consequence of disobedience or breach of temporary injunction. In the case of disobedience of any injunction granted or other order made under Rule 1 or Rule 2 or breach of any of the terms on which the injunction was granted or the order made, the court granting the injunction or making the order or any court to which the suit or proceeding is transferred may order the property of the person guilty of such disobedience or breach to be attached and may also order such person to be detained in the civil prison for a term not exceeding three months. Unless in the meantime the court directs his release. But there is a rider, no attachment made under this rule shall remain in force for more than one year, at the end of which time if the <coughs> disobedience or breach continues, the property attached may be sold and out of the proceeds the court may award such compensation as it thinks fit to the injured party and shall pay the balance, if any, to the party entitled thereto. So the three remedies that are <coughs> available are attachment of property of the violator, detention in civil prison, and compensation to the plaintiff. Remedies for violation of permanent injunction, such remedies are available under Order 21, Rule 32 of the CPC. It says, where the party against whom a decree for an injunction has been passed has had an opportunity of obeying the decree and has willfully failed to obey it, the decree may be enforced in the case of a decree for restitution of conjugal rights by the attachment of its property or in the case of a decree for specific performance of contract 
or for an injunction by his detention in the civil prison or by the attachment of his property or by birth. <coughs> Some notable decisions regarding injunction uh, in uh, Tata Motors Limited versus the Brihan Mumbai Electric Supply and Transport Undertaking, that's best, and others, Civil Appeal Number 3897 of 2023, the Honorable Supreme Court in a case where injunction was sought regarding awarding of contract tender concerning uh, public interest at large observed <coughs> The court ordinarily should not interfere in matters relating to tender or contract to state at not the entire tender procedure at the stage when the contract is well underway would not be in public interest. Initiating a fresh tender process at this stage may consume a lot of time and also loss to the public exchequer to the tune of crores of rupees. The financial burden implications on the public exchequer that the state may have to meet with if the court directs <coughs> issue of a fresh tender notice should be one of the guiding factors that the court should keep in mind. In Jagdish Mandal versus State of Orissa and others, uh, it's 2007 judgment, it was observed that <clears throat> if the decision relating to award of contract is bona fide and is in public interest, courts will not interfere by exercising powers <clears throat> of judicial review, even if a procedural aberration or error in assessment of prejudice to a tender is built out power of judicial review will not be invoked to protect private interest at the cost of public interest or to decide contractual disputes. In uh, Padiyar Pralatji, Chenaji deceased through LRS um, versus Maniven Jagmal Bhai deceased through LRS and others, it's 2022 judgment by Honorable Epic Score, where it was observed that once the dispute with respect to title is settled, and it is held as the plaintiff, it is, in that case, the suit by the plaintiff for permanent injunction shall not be maintainable against the true owner. In uh, <coughs> Bharat Bhushan Gupta versus Pratap Narayan Burma and another uh, 2022 judgment, uh, on the Supreme Court held that uh, in a super mandatory and prohibitory injunction is not required to be valued at the market value of a property observed. Yeah, it observed that it remains straight that it is the nature of relief claimed in the plain which is decisive of the question of suit valuation. As a necessary corollary, the market value does not become decisive of suit valuation merely because an immovable property is the subject matter of litigation. The market value of an immovable property involved in the litigation might have its relevance depending on the nature of relief claimed, but ultimately, the valuation of any particular suit has to be decided <coughs> primarily with reference to the relief or relief scheme. So that, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> that is 15. I hope uh, that was, uh, that covered all the aspects of mandatory and uh, permanent injunction. So if there is any question that anybody would like to ask. And, uh, can you bring a chair? Was an overview of the first session. It was a beautiful presentation, and I'm sure you may have questions in on, on your mind. That is an interactive session, and I leave this uh, house open for discussion. Some questions on your mind you have. I'll just share yeah, problems I'm facing. I think uh, just for the benefit of the training judges, uh, temporary injunction is by the word itself temporary. Perpetual is continuous. Mandatory is something which uh, tells you to do something, positive act, and other is restraining. You are not supposed to do something. Right? Then uh, we have this prima facie case, uh, balance of convenience and irreparable loss and injury. So, in irreparable loss and injury, it does not mean that it cannot be compensated at all. The concept is that it's a significant loss and injury, material loss and injury. And I think, so land acquisition, uh, we are having a problem. A lot of cases are coming for injunctions. So out there, like, I think there's a bar, bar to the civil suits. But then again, cases of title are being decided by the courts also. Because 
normally and uh, last time I had to pass an injunction to restrain the compensation money from being deposited in the defendant's account. So. I think uh, by ordering and restraining the compensation money from being deposited in the defendant's account, I think it was a good uh, decision because that would maintain the status quo of the case, I think. Otherwise, the whole purpose of the suit would be frustrated. I think that's uh, a, a good question. And <clears throat> what uh, Mr. Rohini has given as an overview about injunction, uh, these three rules or these three principles of granting injunction or refusing an injunction has to be kept in mind always by the courts. And uh, you'll find an umpteen number of judgments, orders of the superior courts, including our own Honorable High Court as to what are the principles under which an injunction order is to be granted or refused. Number one, the prime FSI case which Mr. Javian just talked about. A prime FSI case does not mean that there has to be a case which has to be proved to a hilt. Right? Prime FSI case means that there has to be a case where at that juncture, where you are considering only the plaint and the documents of the plaintiff, you feel that when an evidence is led, the case could be proved. Okay. It could be in favor of the plaintiff, and it only means that at that stage, or at that initial stage, the documents or the papers or the print is such that uh, you, are, you know or you feel that yes, there is a case of the plaintiff which if the evidence is left, a decree will follow. And the second stage, like he said, is the uh, irreparable injury or loss. Now, in s that's my experience. In civil matters, I think there is hardly any case where Money cannot be a compensation for a civil dispute. Okay. For business dispute, it's mostly money. Money can quantify almost all your dispute. But yes, there are some cases or some uh, things where, where you cannot uh, compensate in terms of money. Correct? So, in these matters, if you feel that uh, compensating later with money will not be proper or will not be equitable, then I think this also falls under the category of irreparable loss. And uh, then the court may feel that an injunction order has to be granted, that is, temporary injunction. And the third will be, of course, the balance of convenience, or inconvenience, some people call it, that is, if you grant an injunction, will it be more detrimental to the plaintiff or by withholding the injunction order? Now that is a question we have to answer to grant or refuse an injunction at that stage. And these three go hand in hand, but it's not that one of these principles are lesser in uh, value or the other, but what is important, first of all, is that prime FSI case. If there is no case at all, then there is no question of granting an injunction order. And temporary injunction under 39 Rule 1 and 2, these provisions have to be followed while granting an injunction. And also, like uh, for Specific Relief Act, for granting this temporary injunction, it is the same principles which you have to keep in mind when you grant a temporary injunction for under the Specific Relief Act. A perpetual injunction, like Madam said, it will come or it will be at the time of passing a decree. When you pass a final order, then there will be perpetual injunction when it's a relief claim under the Specific Relief Act that uh, the parties will either be forbidden or the other way around. And the mandatory injunction also will be, it's mostly 
directive in nature to perform, to do, or to make an obligation that you have to do a certain act for performance of that contract. So this will be mandatory in action. And I think it is important to also understand, Madam has already um, given us quite a number of case laws on this point, but what if there is a violation of this order? If there is a violation of an order for temporary injunction passed under order 39, rule 1 and 2, rule 2A is the answer. Right? For a perpetual injunction, now there is the other rule which uh, Ms. Rohini just quoted. Now what about mandatory injunction? I think that was left out. Can you what if there is a violation of mandatory injunction? I think that was also to some extent mandatory. There Otherwise, see, if there is a perpetual injunction uh, um, or temporary injunction which is violated, 2A or the other provision would say that you can attach the property. And if it persists, even after six months, then it will be sold off. And whatever the value, it is, you compensate the plaintiff and the remaining extra, you return it to that defendant. And that is, but what about mandatory injunction also? At times? Order 21. So I mean like if mandatory injunction is not uh, uh, uttered to, then the plaintiff will have to go for execution. I feel that, uh, of course, there will be these provisions, but uh, I think content of court will also come in handy because when there is a violation of uh, mandatory injunction, mandatory injunction is a little other way around where you you don't restrain a party but you direct a party to do a positive act. You tell him that you have to do this or that you have to perform this part of the contract and if there is a violation of that order then the uh, person who is aggrieved can also move for content of for not following that particular order. And that is a positive order to do a positive act. So this is one thing uh, we should remember. And coming back to Mr. Javin's question, Madam has already answered. The civil courts will not have jurisdiction to decide on land compensation on the on the under the even the new land uh, acquisition act there's a it's quite a, a long name I cannot remember fully but uh, yes transparency yes. in land acquisition correct so what actually happens is under this act For a public purpose, it is required, the government requires, central government or the state government requires that property for the purpose of a public purpose. Now, a notice is issued, widely published. Now, there is valuation of that property, which is to be acquired, market value, whatever value. It is the assessment that has to be made by the district collector. District collector is the authority under that act where the compensation is to be made, uh, is to be assessed. Now, what about uh, the right of this particular, though it is a little away from this particular topic, but since you have raised it, sir, I was just trying to answer to your question. But what happens if uh, the landowner is not satisfied with the valuation that has been assessed by the district collector? Now, that is the time when people may come to the court a civil court saying that we are not satisfied with the valuation. Um, it has to be either because there is a title dispute, this dispute, what dispute, and they may come. And the question actually may be about compensation, about the value, the quantification of that particular compensation. Yes, sir. Now, this, this, uh, yes. This, uh, I think uh, it's the uh, district judge who's the authority to where the. Uh, Correct. 
person can come and. Correct. Correct. Now, under this uh, act itself, there is a provision where a party is, is not satisfied, where a landowner is not satisfied with the compensation amount, he can come or she can come to an authority established under this particular act. Now here, recently it is the district judge who was uh, who's given this authority to, um, to verify and to take this proceeding and uh, see whether the compensation is all right or not. All right. And this, the order passed by the authority under the uh, land acquisition, the new land acquisition act, it is only the honorable high court, of, uh, high court of that particular state which will have jurisdiction to hear the appeal of that authority. Now the district judge, by default, because of the uh, office that we hold here, has been made an authority. But the act provides that that. Authority can be a person who is a district judge or has been a district judge. So here it is the district judge who is presently has been given this additional duty to make assessment for land uh, acquisition whenever there is a dispute for compensation. Now similarly, it may be a little interest to all of you that uh, uh, over these 10 years or 15 years, you have seen that there are a number of uh, roads that are being constructed all over the state. But even the, for road construction, there is acquisition of land. And mostly, when there is a national highway coming up, when there is a national highway coming up, it is the National Highways Act, I think it's 1958, which comes into operation. And under the National Highways Act, also, there are these similar provisions which has, which has been made. And when there is an acquisition of land, the land owner will, can agitate if the land owner is not satisfied with the compensation that has been quantified by the district collector, which, which in uh, National Highways Act is known as CALA, C-A-L-A. So the appeal, or if not, uh, it's not an appeal exactly, but if the landowner is not satisfied with the quantum of compensation, you can file an application. And this can go before an arbitrator. An arbitrator here, it will be here, it's mostly the uh, secretary law, government of sitting, who takes over the arbitration case of this nature. And then if there is no satisfaction, or if the parties, one of the parties are not satisfied, it comes under the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996, under Section 34, comes back to the district court, the district judge, as an application to set aside the order of the So, this is, I think, one question we be placed. If there is any more questions, you can please. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, so there is one topic which is not covered here. Add interim. Injunctions. So normally, she covered this first. It's a preliminary injunction. I just want to share my experience because yes. I was not aware of it. I came to know while uh, in the court. So probably it might be helpful for them, or probably they know it also. Because when it comes to injunction, there are three principles, uh, like Madam and Sir just said. But then when it comes to uh, dealing cases with regards to government, then I think public policy also needs to be considered. This is what I had read in some judgment, that you also need to see the public policy also, which I was discussing with Zabiang also. He was saying that it might come into balance of convenience and inconvenience. But then it was specifically given in one particular judgment that uh, while dealing with injunctions, so uh, when it comes to government, like he says, then you have to see the public policy also and see whether it is for the betterment of the public. I think uh, there were two cases, uh, decisions cited regarding 2022 and 2023 uh, regarding public policies. So in that we have to be aware uh, of the pertains of public policy. We will we'll have to see uh, that uh, public policy is given preference. preference. Yes. Uh, so in that, that case, Yes. I just wanted to inform them in case if they, because yes, that thing you will not cases. know it while reading the book. Right. Like CPC, you will come to know only when you read the judgment result that eventually you will 
So I thought I would just share it with them. Recently also when I was posted in Jordan, I had a similar case. So I had to refuse the injunction because it kind of like, uh, you know, affected the public policy more. So I had to refuse the injunction. So ultimately what happened, he, the <coughs> purpose of the suit was frustrated. So uh, I had to dismiss the suit also for non-prosecution. Because the plaintiff, he stopped making appearances. I, I came across the same type of cases in gazing. So then I might read about it. Madam, uh, share the case. It's there. Yes, the uh, details of the one regarding Excuse public me. policy that you faced. Uh, the second last page. Uh, this one and no, no, before this. This Just one and the situation. before one. Tata, this one is the one. The latest one. Just to move on with the inputs, you know, public policy, all right, you consider when you take up a matter like this. Uh, but there is a specific provision under the Specific Relief Act, Madam has dealt it also, 41, right? 41, H A. Whenever there is this infrastructure coming up, and those infrastructure which are in the schedule, you normally there is a bar of uh, passing an injunction, perpetual, temporary, or mandatory, so far as specific relief act is concerned. All right, and uh, also uh, we have to keep in mind what happens, like uh, for violation. 151 is also very important. I just it just struck my mind. 151 of the CPC, which gives an inherent power to the court whenever there is either no provision or insufficient provision. Now what happens to mandatory injunction like this? You know, if there is no specific provision, invoking 151, you can go for invoking a content under the content side. Right? So this is one thing. And if we have, do we have any more questions on on this? I think only two of us are speaking and they are very excited. Right, you can give your inputs because this is correct. This is an interactive session, and we are not here to uh, teach or you know. It's something like we share our experiences, and we have, of course, like I said in the introduction, that we have problems which we encounter on a daily basis in the courts, and when we have where where we don't have a forum to discuss, and this is a forum where we can thrash out whatever problems that we have and find solution so that we can perform our, our uh, duties much, much efficiently. If we can close this session, madam, should we close this session? With, uh, madam, I'd like to thank you for uh, your valuable time and the uh, presentation that you have made. Thank you, madam. Thank you. So moving on to the second session, uh, let me call upon, first of all, Mr. Seseham Subha, uh, who will be making a presentation and sharing his experiences about uh, the concept of default bail, remand, and uh, dealing with POXO cases by the Juvenile Justice Courts. Uh, sorry, Courts. All right. Uh, Mr. Seseham Subha, who is the learned judicial magistrate and civil judge of Yangam. So, Judge Hengtok, uh, Lonet, uh, Deputy Director, Sikkim Judicial Academy, Lonet, Chief Judicial Magistrate, Namji, uh, Lonet, Civil Judge, from Judicial Magistrate, Hengtok, and Lonet, Civil Judge, from Judicial Magistrate, Rongli. Good morning to one and all. Uh, the topic of my presentation is our uh, concept and key issues of default bill and demand and dealing of box cases by juvenile justice courts. So I would like to begin with the first one. That's remand. So remand uh, simply means ordering uh, detention into a custody a pending interrogation or investigation. So we state as to what are the rights that are available in, uh, pertaining to uh, life and person and liberty and rights in case of arrest and detention. First is Article 21, Protection of Life and Personal Liberty. 
So this is one of the most uh, cherished and jealously protected rights which a person has. It not only restricts to citizens, but it's available to every person. It says, no person shall be deprived of his life and personal liberty except according to procedure established by law. Meaning thereby, if someone's right to personal liberty is to be interfered with, that, is, that can only be done by way of uh, procedure established by law and not otherwise. Another such right is Article 22, that is protection against uh, arrest and detention in certain cases. Clause 2 provides that every person who is arrested and detained has to be produced before a magistrate within 24 hours and cannot be uh, kept under detention for more than that period. So this is another right in case of arrest and detention. And another is section 57 of the Code of Criminal uh, Civil uh, Criminal Procedure that is pro person arrested not to be detained more than 24 hours. So this is the incorporation of rights under Article 22 with regard to a uh, person when arrested and not to be detained for more than 24 hours. So, as we see that a person's liberty can be interfered with uh, procedure established by law and uh, detention can be made under the authority of the magistrate. So, this is that procedure established by law by which uh, someone's liberty can be interfered with. That is section 57 under which a magistrate is authorized to remand accused. This section provides procedure when investigation cannot be completed in 24 hours. Now it's not uh, possible and practicable in all cases that investigation is completed within 24 hours. So what if uh, accused is required to be detained for more than 24 hours? So in that circumstances, section 167 comes into picture. Under Proviso to Section 167, uh, Subsection 2, uh, it provides or prescribes the limit uh, with beyond which uh, magistrate cannot authorize detention or uh, authorize for custody. So this, it is that period within which uh, investigating agency must complete the investigation and file charges. That is 90 days and 60 days as the case may be. This is categorized on the basis of uh, imprisonment imposed. The Supreme Court of India in 1994 for SSC 602 has uh, observed as to object behind the anything section 167 that is detention of an accused person should not be permitted in custody pending investigation for any unreasonable longer period. So that is, this is the object uh, behind enacting this. Uh, and in another case, 2007, SEC Online Madras 743, the Honorable High Court has said that whenever application for police remand comes, uh, it must be strictly considered on materials because it involves fundamental right and personal liberty of an individual. This is the honest Kumar guidelines uh, wherein uh, in order to dissuade the magistrates from uh, passing remand order in uh, casually and mechanically manner, the Honorable Supreme Court of India has directed that magistrates shall produce the report which includes checklist, the reason for this and materials which necessitated, necessitated arrest and only after recording its satisfaction on the basis of material placed before it, him, he is an authorized detention. And Supreme Court has further uh, settled, has given a guideline that who, any magistrate who passes a detention order without recording uh, reasons shall also be liable, liable for judicial inquiry, uh, departmental action by the consent high court. So this is with regard to remand. Now default bill. As I have said, provided to Section 167, subsection 2 provides for uh, limits uh, within which investigation has to be completed. So, 90 days in case offense involved is punishable with death, imprisonment for life, or imprisonment for a term not less than 10 years, and 60 days in case of other offenses. 
however, it has to be kept in mind that the default bill one accrues, once accrued, the detainee or the person under custody is to prepare to end us for this bill, then he should be released on default bill. Honorable Supreme Court of India in 2020, 10 SSC 616 has held that right to default bill is not a mere statutory right, but is a part of procedure established by law under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. Therefore, it's a fundamental right. And in another case, 2017, 15 SSC 67, it was held that it's not necessary that the accused needs to file a formal written application for default bill. If he submits, uh, verbally submits uh, for a default bill, that will suffice. Like, uh, court has a jurisdiction in case of, uh, uh, while considering bill under other provisions, but in case of default bill, it was held that it's an absolute right. So once uh, the arrested person or detainee ex uh, wants to exercise the right to default bill, there is no discretion on the part of magistrate to reject the application for default bill. Now, the Honorable Supreme Court has further uh, imposed a positive duty on the court uh, and has held that it is the duty of the court to apprise the person of his indefensible right to default bill. Like the right to default bill accrues on the expiry of uh, 90 or 60 days as the case may be. And when that statutory period expires, on 91st day or 61st day, right to default bill accrues. Now, if the person does not exercise his right to default bill and subsequently chalam or charge it is filed, then there extinguishes the right to default bill on filing of chalam. And in some of cases, investigating agency has tendency to file charge it uh, without completing investigation just to interfere with the right to uh, statutory right uh, of default bill of the accused. So, in such circumstances, the Honorable Supreme Court has held that charge sheet cannot be filed without completing the investigation. So, such charge sheet would not extinguish the right to default bill. Next is computing period for default bill. Now, 60 days or 90 days is the period for completing investigation and filing charge sheet. That 90 days or 60 days is to be computed from the day when a magistrate authorizes a detention and the day of remark should be included for considering default bill. These are the materials with regard to uh, default bill. Now moving on to my next uh, topic that is dealing of POXO cases by Juvenile Justice Court. I fairly admit that I could not find much material on this topic. I have collected few. So like the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act 2012 has been enacted in order to protect uh, children, be that male children, female children, uh, under the age of 18 years. Now, not only adult or majors are booked under this Boxer Act, but juveniles also are also booked for committing offence under this POXO Act. However, Section 34 of this Act uh, provides that procedure in case of commission of offence by child and determination of age by the special court. Here, it says that when any offence under this Act is committed by a child, such child shall be dealt with under the provisions of Juvenile Justice Care and Protection Act. So, there is no separate provision when uh, juvenile is involved in POXO cases. It has, there has, irrespective of commission of offence under general law, like IPC or the POXO Act, they are required to be dealt with uh, under the Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act. In this case, uh, the court has laid a difference between a criminal justice system and juvenile justice system. 
where it was held that in criminal trials, the object is to record the finding or guilt, finding guilt or innocence. And in case of established guilt, the prime object of sentencing is to punish the guilt. Whereas in case of uh, juvenile justice system, a uh, juvenile inquiry is to find the guilt, innocence of the juvenile and to investigate the underlying social and familial causes of the alleged crime. And the aim of juvenile sentencing is to reform and rehabilitate the errant juvenile. So like, once juvenile is booked uh, for commission of offence under uh, the POXO Act, he or she shall be, uh, he or she shall be dead under, uh, as per the provisions of uh, Juvenile Justice Act, and the object is not to sentence on like uh, in criminal justice system, but uh, is to reform and rehabilitate the alleged juvenile. Thank you. I'd leave uh, the house open for discussion. Any questions? I have a question. Um, is the charge sheet complete if the CFSL report has not been filed or the RFSL report? That has always confused me when I've observed um, what I've observed in courts. So, if so, could maybe ask them. When the um, when the investigation is over, normally the charge sheet is filed. As you see, or as you have observed. Um, the report from CFSL or RFSL it takes, it takes a very, very long time for them to file their report. Now, one sends a requisition or seeks a CFSL report. Now that forensic report, when it takes time, it doesn't mean that the IU is precluded from filing the charge sheet. Now, if the IU has come to a conclusion from the investigation that he has done, that prima facie let's say for example 302 case, there is a prime FSI case, there are sufficient evidence so far as the investigator, uh, investigating agency is concerned that uh, we can sustain this charge. Right? There is an eyewitness, there is a complainant, there is this and that and the doctors and the other evidence, but forensic evidence could be, could be uh, an additional evidence to these type of cases. And in such cases, I think the charge sheet can be filed without waiting for the forensic report. Because waiting for forensic report will cause I think, absolute delay in, in criminal cases, which 167 also aims at preventing it. Now, uh, just taking this question a little further, what happens in 167? Why is 167 even there? That may be a question that we ask. Now the simple reason could, is that the investigation of a criminal case should not take inordinate time to complete. It has to be completed within a reasonable time. That is the reason why the framers of this, uh, the, uh, the framers of uh, this particular code thought it fit that in a case of this nature it has to be six months and for a case which is punishable with life imprisonment or the like or graver sentences then it has to be 90 days within three months the charge sheet has to be filed which is a fair amount of time to complete the investigation now if the investigation is not complete what happens let's say for example default bail is not there there is no provision now the person who is arrested is in custody. He is detained. Now what happens when a person is detained? Sir has just mentioned about Article 21. Your right to personal liberty. No. Amongst all the fundamental rights, I think the right to personal liberty is one of the greatest fundamental rights to any individual. It is the most cherished right. I think many of you have read uh, Justice Krishna Iyer's um, autobiography, many of his books. What he says in one of these is 
that when he was also, he had also gone to jail. He was arrested, imprisoned for a certain amount of time because of his, uh, he, was a, he was an activist. And he said that one day in prison is almost like, I, I cannot see the exact quote, but it's almost the same like one day in prison, <coughs> one day detained, is almost like one year outside, or these many years outside. Which means that it is so difficult <coughs> for that person who is detained to pass that every day. And if you cross 90 days, and uh, if you cross 60 days, and if the trial does not begin on time, or if it does not conclude, and that person is simply behind the bars, I think it will, it will be a gross violation of this, not only this particular fundamental right, but it will be an injustice to this particular person. So I think, Madam, uh, even after, even if the RFSL or CFSL report is awaited, charge sheet can be filed where there is sufficient evidence to go for trial. Yes. Normally, it is mentioned also in the charge sheet that the supplementary so I think our session is a short one judgment. I think about half baked charge sheets being filed and that it will not defeat the right to pay. So it is easy for the Supreme Court to say that I'm gifted. Mean, but practically for us magistrates, let's say the charge sheet has come to the CGM, the magistrate, the bail application is filed to the magistrate. So how will he you know, see the charge sheet. It is a, uh, since the whole trial is an adversarial trial, can the judicial magistrate see the charge sheet and see, decide whether it's a half baked charge sheet or whether it's a proper charge sheet? Practical charge <coughs> sheet is out of that. In that Can a judge see yes. the charge is not good or the charge is not bad? No, we will not get into this uh, this discussion because uh, what has been what has been observed and held by the honorable superior courts is because of the tremendous wisdom and uh, the experience that they uh, they pass in order. So, but uh, of course, under one six seven. The magistrates have no power. If there is, if it crosses beyond this limit, it is a matter of right. And if there is an application, it has to be granted. So one conclusion, uh, Shishan suggests that the uh, period of detention is to be counted, uh, period, period is to be counted, 60 days and 90 days period is to be counted from the period, from the time of detention. Is it from the time of arrest or from the time of arrest of remand? From the date of remand. It is from the date of remand. Now, it may be confusing. Even we had a discussion just in the morning. It's from the date of remand. Why? Under 167 also makes a provision and it specifies that under 57, within 24 hours, a person who is arrested has to be produced before the magistrate. nearest magistrate. It doesn't say magistrate. No. It says nearest magistrate because, of course, we are all, uh, there are magistrates here. And some of you may feel that, um, no, I am a magistrate from Yangang. This is a case of Namchi. Now, he has to be produced in Namchi. Or let's say this is a case of uh, Gantok. Why is he bringing it to me? Now, 57 of the Code of Criminal Procedure says that once arrested, he has to be produced before the nearest magistrate. So a nearest magistrate could be anybody having jurisdiction or not. Once a magistrate, uh, once a person is produced before a nearest magistrate, the magistrate will have to follow the mandate laid under the guidelines of Arnish Kumar as well, and then direct that this person be produced before the jurisdictional magistrate thereafter. So for that particular, and on the day of arrest, Within 24 hours, when a person is produced, if a remand is given, then it will be counted from the date of remand. The computational period for 60 hours. Uh,
90 days. For yes, it uh, comes under transit remand also. And for example, not even transit remand. For let's say, uh, let's take an example of our state. From one district to another, it may not take uh, a full day or two days to travel. But even if it is arrested in another district, the person can be produced before the nearest judicial magistrate. And for transit remand, of course, if it is from one state to another, it has to be produced before the nearest magistrate where he was arrested, and the nearest other particular magistrate will issue the transit remand for production of that person within a particular framework. Yeah, But then the accused was produced before the jurisdictional magistrate within, say, five hours. Is it in that case, is it necessary to produce the accused before the, before the nearest magistrate and not the jurisdictional magistrate? The distance is short. Like, for example, the accused was arrested in the syllabus. So the nearest magistrate would be the jurisdictional magistrate of the But then it could be produced within 24 hours before, say, Namchi. Is it necessary to produce before the nearest magistrate or he can produce in the first instance before the jurisdiction of magistrate? I think it is proper to produce him before the nearest magistrate because right at the time of arrest there could be many questions that could come up. You know, every hour after arrest matters for that person who is detained. So the moment a person is detained put into custody, the, he has that right. And when it comes to a nearest magistrate, it could be illegal arrest. It could be illegal detention. So the nearest magistrate, when the, the case comes before the nearest magistrates, and the nearest magistrate can then and there, if, he, if, he, if, there, if there is no um, a, a matter to be, for that person to be arrested, the nearest magistrate can also tell him that this is an illegal arrest and I will not allow remand at all. It is not necessary that it has to be produced before the jurisdiction. So the, so the issue of slavery is concerned falls under the Bengal state. So the moment any uh, the, any one of our courts uh, issue warrant of arrest and accuse the eye of the case is arresting the slavery then the I.O. of the case uh, has to inform the I.O. of that particular jurisdiction first. Then after arrest, the I.O. of the case has to produce before the nearest magistrate of that particular state. Because Bengal is state, there is a juridic, statistical jurisdiction issue is also there. Absolutely, so, sir. Yes. I think this is another yes. uh, explanation for Madam, your question. because. So far as the territorial jurisdiction is also concerned, that has to also be kept in mind. Because when a person is arrested from another state, a police from one state cannot just go to another state and arrest. Yes. The police station under whose jurisdiction that person is to be arrested, the officer in charge has to be informed and Assistance has to be taken from that yes. particular police station to go and arrest that person. On and on, they cannot come and arrest without informing the I.O. of the case. Correct. And one, uh, when I was a member of the bar, uh, warrant of arrest was issued from Bihar, uh, Gopalji. He was arrested in midnight. And with the assistance of I.O. Uh, duly informing the I.O. of the Sardar. And for transit remand, he was produced before the Lonet CGM. And he was uh, allowed to cross the jurisdiction of the Sikkim mm -hmm. with the direction to produce before mm -hmm. the concerned magistrate of Bihar. Yes. Absolutely right, sir. Absolutely. I think this matter has uh, the questions, <coughs> the question pertaining to transit remand and yes. also anticipatory bail. I think recently the Honorable Supreme Court has also uh, settled many of these questions that we may have. You can have a look. I cannot remember the exact case, but if you just see in live law, it was there just a few days ago. Uh, although this is just a second, matter, you know, there was a there was a there was a thing, a judgment on this particular topic as well. 
So before we go to another topic. Then one issue this uh, Mahima Madam has raised. The, we have to see the substance of allegation in the charge set. Suppose uh, in NDPS Act, SATA Act, SFL, uh, FSL or CFSL report is not there. Then we have to see the first, we have to turn out the offence, the provision of the offence, like NDPS Act. So blindly we are just observing 167, 90 days, 60 days. The when a special act is involved as an offence, like NDPS Act, I of the case is authorized to detain 180 days as per section 30, 36A subsection 4. So there is no question of infraining default bail within a period of 60, 90 days. And the Supreme Court says whether non filing of CFSL report. FCL report is incomplete charge sheet for entertaining the default bill. No. That cannot be. In the absence of this particular report in the charge sheet, cannot be considered an incomplete charge sheet. So IO of the case should be allowed to file the charge sheet. And uh, there is a judgment of Supreme Court. And the moment we see any special act is involved, we have to see the substantial amount of offence provided in that particular provision. Not and blindly, we can see 60 days, 90 days. Like in moderate case, yes, learned resource person rightly pointed out. What more required? Just civil report is not so relevant. The only thing is this, what the witness says in that particular case has to be considered. Yes, sir, please proceed. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, one thing I just remembered, which I came to know that uh, Mahima Madam has mentioned, during computing the period of 60 days and 90 days also, if the imprisonment is up to 10 years, if it says imprisonment is up to 10 years, then the period is 60. We have to count it within 60 days and not 90 days. Usually when we see punishment up to 10 years, we tend to believe that it is 90 mm -hmm. days. But then when it's up to only extend to 10 years, then it has to be within 60 days. Absolutely. This is what uh, just share it. Absolutely. Absolutely right. And uh, of course, there are other <coughs> topics as well which uh, Mr. Sesehan has discussed. And we will break for a cup of tea yes. for, let's say, five, ten minutes. Then we get back to the same topic. Share PC. A specific statutory provision is given. If you fail to comply with that particular provision, then you cannot uh, at all is uh, proceed ahead because ultimately you have to acute the because that pro provision is very strong. Mm -hmm. Who is who is competent person to file complaint where? So so it says no court shall take cognizance right. except on complaint in writing of that court. Yes yes. Now complaint has not come from that court. The predecessor has already taken cognizance. With all respect. I cannot proceed further also and, and I cannot remove that cognizance also because I, I don't have the power of review. There is a judgment of Supreme Court. So in such a case, I think the party has to approach the in, High Court. In Lonnie Judicial Magistrate Court, if you dig out the record, BK Rai was there as I think uh, uh, counsel of the accused. I was there on behalf of the complainant. Similar issue was raised. Ultimately, I think uh, he came across one judgment. So that particular complaint was dismissed. So the moment you violate the provision of 195, you cannot proceed ahead. Better to. So how will they dispose of it now? So that is the thing. You have to pass the order saying that uh, non compliance of a number of Supreme Court judgments you get under section 195 of CRPC. Violation of one, that particular provision ultimately lead to the dismissal of company. Very strong provision in CRPC. But you have to see this allegation under which section of IPC that allegation is. Yes, sir. 195 is being affected. No, no. What offense was committed? You have to see that offense also. Thank <laughs> you.
Maybe I can. You have very good case to order. Very good case to give the unit. What I can do is, if the charges is framed, then acquittal. Okay. If it is before the charge, then discharge. But at, of course, this is a criminal trial, so there will be there will be a a stage for three thirteen. At three thirteen, if you feel that these are all the is I, this is a regular proceeding or there is absolutely no reason for you to proceed further, you can acquit the person at that stage as well. In this particular case. And I think you will not be doing any wrong. Right. Because even if you come and write a job, <coughs> that would be that would be wrong. So you might be have followed the provision. Not you per se, but it is a continuation. You are from there as another magistrate, a wrong person. You cannot continue a wrong person. So, <clears throat> getting ahead, uh, going ahead with this particular topic, we have discussed about, about uh, the default bill and the uh, 6, 7, how demand is to be done. And uh, there was also another topic of how JJB deals with POXO cases. So let's, uh, I think, hear from Ms. Zanim also, who has dealt Yes, and no more of JZB. Uh, JZB, uh, yes. she's been yes, she's on the street for, we have dealt with the uh, <coughs> case in the Justice And perhaps, yes, Mr. Japan. So I'll just share one case, a very interesting story. Uh, the parties are from a very poor family. On the uh, three brothers, sisters living in one common room, father, mother, everyone, very poor family. So uh, when they were young only, uh, they, they sent the boy to the monastery and the uh, young girl used to work in others' houses and they were separated. When they became teenagers, they again met and they fell in love. Brothers, sisters, uh, the girl got pregnant also. So it was both are minus on top of that. So it was an interesting case I dealt with to show that even you know the uh, socio sociological background also affects how you know how come they got into incest. And so it was a case of consensual uh, physical relation between minors. And I think now uh, there are many judgments coming up where uh, People are being granted bail, even like, even in um, a major falling in love with a minor who are married and all. So I thought are also granting bail and all. So uh, and there's one specific, uh, I think, judgment from Meghalaya High Court, so which directly deals with such cases and has I think acquitted the uh, the accused also. So in JGB, I have mostly found such cases involving. Madam, would you like to share your experience? My experience. <clears throat> so I'll just tell you what, are, what I have experienced and as a principal magistrate, what we need to look into. Upon the demand stage, he looks whether the child is brought before the principal magistrate. Usually what police does is that they will come in the civil court and produce the child. But the Act mandates that the special child, special the special juvenile police has to be there, and the protection officer also has to be there. It is very, very important that is required. But usually, what they do is they just come with the child only. The normal police only they just wear a you know, civil cloak and they just come. But then you you have to insist on that also because the act mandates that you will have to require that. And the other thing which is important is uh, while dealing with all kind of offenses, not even POXO, and mostly in POXO what happens, there comes a situation when a girl and a boy, both are minors. Both are minor and the physical act also which has happened is consensual, but usually when the complaint is come against the minor child, minor boy, so uh, 
the first so uh, few proceedings are where we determine the age of the child. So the determination of age of the child, so like sir had said from Kokso case, and especially in remand, one problem I think I just mentioned that. So there was one particular remand of Rampu, Rampu case where two adult person was bought and one person of 19 years old was bought, but there was no uh, school certificate, nothing, no document <coughs> to determine the age. So after that, what I did was because uh, I also didn't know, but later I saw there is our seeking judicial, seeking juvenile justice rules. So rule. I don't know exactly which rule, but that mandates that when uh, the ascertainment of the age of the child needs to be done, then you will have to send it to the medical board. And medical board also needs to be constituted. So then <coughs> for ascertainment, I have sent it to the medical board or for the age of the child, asserting the age of the child. So then after that order was sent, I think the medical board was also constituted before there was no medical board. So once that was constituted, and then the age was, uh, they had sent the bone test, ossification test, and the dental test, from which they had determined the age and had sent. So after that, applying the marking of error principle of two years. Is that two years ago? Either of the sides. Yes, either side, and then we had determined the age of the child. So that is also there, but usually what happens is section 80, something or 90, something 91 says that we need to first look into the school certificate, then birth certificate, then there are procedures how we look into it. And if the original is there, or just by looking at the child only, if you feel that that person is below 19, is a child, then at that time you can determine the age. So that is also there. That's, that's and there is one aspect that I needed some clarification that you could help me also. Uh, as per, uh, Subsection 33 of Section 2 of the JJ Act, uh, heinous offense has been defined as uh, offenses for which the minimum punishment under the IPC or any other law for the time being enforces minimum sentences imprisonment for seven years or more. So, Section uh, IPC Code Section 457 is uh, IPC. IPC. The minimum. That is learning how stress us. Yes. The sentences uh, committing of any offense punishable with imprisonment of either description or a term which may extend to, and if the offense is intended to, uh, to be committed is theft, the term for the imprisonment may be extended to four, 14 years. So in this case, I am like uh, in a dilemma whether this offense falls under the category of heinous offense or simply a serious offense because the minimum here has not been given yet. And as for the previous definition of heinous offense, the minimum is seven years or more. Uh, 457, can you please read again? Uh, lurking house trespass or house breaking by night in order to commit offense. But then uh, with this section, 457, the other section uh, uh, booked is 380. So it's lurking house what trespass is, for commission of What yeah. does again 457 mean? Yes, sir? What does 457 say? If the offense intended to be committed is theft, the term of imprisonment may be extended to 14 years. Otherwise, what is the manual for uh, the house trespass? Uh, extended up to five years. Up to five years. So it has to be taken five years. So five years is the minimum. So what it says is, which may extend to four, five years, or which may extend to fourteen years. It can be from one year to fourteen years. So this will not be a heinous offense in my opinion. In your opinion, it is heinous offense. It is not. It is not because it can be from one year also, two year also. It is five years is which may extend. So no, minimum is seven years sir, for heinous offenses. For years, it has to be not less than 7 years. Minimum has to be 7 years. 457, if it is only house trespass, like you said, if it is 5 years, and if the intention is for theft, then it will extend up to 14 years. Then you will have to read it with 5 years. House trespass per se. And if it is with theft, then it will extend to 14 years. So that means it will not be less than 5 years, but it can extend 6, 7, 8 years, 9 years, up to 14 years, depending on the 
uh, kind of nature of this. Yes. All right. So you know, I think one important thing in GGV cases is where uh, nowadays uh, the, the section is such that uh, the the child shall not be uh, sent to uh, for remand uh, unless like you know there is a threat to him or there is a threat to his safety or he will be again uh, mixing around with some known harmful thing. So most of the cases we grant to the child. I uh, think two cases I demanded. One was in murder case. So there was a genuine threat to him. He was involved in a murder case at election. So the uh, the deceased father had openly in media said that if the uh, uh, government does not do anything, I'll kill them. So genuine threat was there, so I put it in jail. Another was that brother sister case since they were living in the same house. So I think that's that's right. So this has opened up a lot of discussion which I also intended. And uh, Ms. Ramyang has given us an overview of how cases are dealt under the POXO Act. And here it was, uh, sorry, under the GG, by the, under the GG Act by the Juvenile Justice Board. And uh, we had GG cases, but with special emphasis to the POXO related matters. So normally POXO related matters comes in heinous offenses because um, most of the provisions are more than seven years and if it is of course um, penetrative sexual assault or aggravated penetrative sexual assault then it may also extend to imprisonment for life and the minimum is after 2019 it is 20 years minimum sentence is 20 years but which may extend to life and it may also be the reminder of his natural life correct in many of these uh, certain provisions <coughs> And uh, I think Mr. Sisiham has discussed this entirely. And uh, one thing I'd like you all to remember is when you take up Juvenile Justice Act cases, uh, the first thing to do, of course, remand is the first thing that may come to you, but the first thing to do is under 94 of 94 is to determine the age. The moment you see a person and if you feel that he is a juvenile or she is a juvenile, you can see, of course, by the assessment of a physical look of a person, merely a five-year-old child or a seven-year-old child, or whatever it is, twelve-year-old child, you can understand. And you don't need to go for birth certificate or... Uh, if you cannot determine, there, is what, there, are, there are cases which are borderline cases, and then you see for, number one is the birth certificate issued by the municipal authority, or if that is not there, by the school authorities. If that is not there, then the ossification test is the last resort. Mm. All right. And what we need to do is first follow 94. Because if we have a provision, section 94, this provision will override or it will prevail over the rules. So <coughs> instead of sending it to the medical board, first let's uh, first find out if there is no such a uh, provision or whatever it is, then you may uh, deal with the rules. So with this, uh, thank you for your for your presentation and thank you for, uh, I think, uh, giving us this opportunity to talk about and uh, talk to each other and discuss our own experiences about how, how we dealt and how we are dealing with books related matters and not only books related matters but many matters under the GG Act as well. So thank you. Thank you. which is about sharing the best practices regarding custodial death, recording of statement under 164 CRPC. These are two topics that uh, has been provided by the Academy, for which I'd like to request uh, learned judicial magistrate, come civil judge, wrongly, uh, Ms. Mahima Rai, to please come up and uh, give your presentation and share with us your experience. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, learned Principal District and Sessions Judge Ken Talk, Learned Deputy Director, Second Judicial Academy, Learned CJM Nam Chi, Learned Civil Judge, Come Judicial Magistrate Ken Talk, 
and my colleague learned in civil judge contribution as Shri Dianya. Um, before I commence with the presentation, I would like to thank Sikkim Judicial Academy for giving me this opportunity, um, for letting me get out of my comfort zone and giving me this chance of growth. So moving on, uh, first I would like to start with a recording of statements under section 164 of the CRPC. <clears throat> So basically, section 164 of the Code of Criminal Procedure talks about uh, recording of confession and statements. Um, it authorizes the magistrate to record confessions and statements uh, during the course of investigation under Chapter 12 or under any other law for the time being in force or at any time afterwards before the commencement of inquiry or trial irrespective of whether the magistrate has jurisdiction in the case or not. If the magistrate does not have jurisdiction, then subsection 6 of section 164 is applicable, which reads that the magistrate recording a confession or statement under this section shall forward it to the magistrate by whom the case is to be inquired into or tried. Moving on to statement and confession, uh, for this section, statement can either be statement of an accused, um, which means a confessional statement of the accused, or a witness capable of giving information relating to the offence. Uh, so the practice or the procedure um, that relates to recording of confessions. Number one is who records it. Section 164 provides that uh, the judicial magistrate or the metropolitan magistrate records it. However, a police officer to him, to whom any power of a magistrate has been conferred is barred from recording a confession for reasons that we all know. Um, the procedure. Section 164.2 and Section 164.5 of the CRPC is applicable here. Section 164.2 of the CRPC states, basically provides the requisites which are to be followed by the judicial magistrate when taking or recording a confession of an accused. And section 164.5 is important because it is to be remembered by the judicial magistrates that oath is not to be administered um, by recording confession of an accused as this would be illegal and cannot be um, recorded as an evidence, or sorry, has no evidentiary value as was held in Phillips v. State of Karnataka by the Supreme Court in Phillips v. State of Karnataka, 1980, and Babu Bhai Singh Parma as well. Um, then uh, the requisites as given under Section 164.2 is number one, there should be a warning or caution. The judicial magistrate first must explain uh, to the accused giving the confession that he or she is not bound to make the confession. And the other sine qua non of section 164.2 um, of recording a confession is that the judicial magistrate must um, say to the accused that if he or she is going to make um, the confession or give, make the confession, then um, it might be used against him or her uh, during trial. And also, the language that is used to explain to the accused about this is, of course, the language that the accused understands. This warning or caution um, is called the judge's rule in English law, and the rule expressed that when the officer is endeavoring to discover the author of a crime, he may properly seek information about it by reasonable questioning of any person, whether suspected or not. The other requisite is that it needs to be voluntary. The next important requirement uh, that the magistrate must see is that the confession is being made voluntarily by the accused. Um, meaning, how, how does the magistrate do this is by, of course, um, asking questions to the accused. Uh, questions such as why the confession is being made, how did the question of confession first arise, to whom and under what circumstances was the decision first expressed, the motive for making the confession should be asked. And um, this is uh, to satisfy the judicial magistrate that it is being made voluntarily by the accused and that um, no outside influence, especially pressure from the police, um, 
is not there on the accused. However, the, the questions should not be inquisitorial in nature, nor should the questions be asked so as to pin the accused to say a certain statement, and uh, there should also not be any leading questions. If the judicial magistrate is not satisfied that the um, that the confession is being made voluntarily in all conscience, he or she should not record the confession, as has been stated by the Supreme Court in Ayub versus State of UP 2002. Next is uh, next requisite is time for reflection and of course jail custody. Time for reflection must be given to the accused before he makes the confession. This is to ensure that the magistrate knows that the mind of the accused is free from all kinds of complexes that might have um, accrued during the time of the time that he has spent during police custody and also as was held by the Supreme Court that as soon as before recording the confession and after confession uh, the accused must be removed from police custody as keeping the accused in judicial custody would give him sufficient time for reflection and will also have a sobering effect in his mind. This was in this case um, at Para 386, 1994, 3SCC 569. Then moving on to manner of recording confession. The manner of recording confession has been given under section 164, sub section 4. Um, it provides that the confession should be recorded in a manner uh, given under sub section 281 CRPC and that it shall be signed by the person making the confession and also by the magistrate. A memorandum is to be prepared and any irregularity is curable under section 463 of the CRPC. The relevant um, case laws uh, as has been given here is State of MP versus Dayara, Mahavir Singh versus State of Haryana and Dara Singh versus Republic of India where the Supreme Court has laid down principles with regard to Recording of confessions at para 64. Moving on to recording of statements, section 164.5 provides the manner in which a statement is to be recorded by a judicial magistrate other than a confession. Any statement other than a confession made under subsection 1 shall be recorded in such manner here and after provided for the recording of evidence as is in the opinion of the magistrate best fitted to the circumstances of the case and the magistrate shall have the power to administer oath to the person whose statement is so recorded. However, in Jogendra Nahak versus State of Arisa, the Supreme Court has state that, stated that the magistrate has no power under section 164 to record the statement of a person who has not been sponsored by an investigating agency. Um, and another important section is section 164.5a, which uh, uh, relates to recording of statement of rape victims. This was inserted by the Criminal Amendment Act of 2013, which has put a statutory obligation on the judicial magistrate to record the statement of a person um, against whom any sexual offense is committed. As soon as the commission of offense is brought to the notice of the police, and here is the difference, the obligation uh, is not contingent to the IO uh, filing an application to that effect. And the guidelines for recording of statement of rape victims uh, has been laid down by the Honorable Supreme Court in the state of Karnataka versus Shibana. Before I conclude, uh, there is also the provision for um, recording a statement of any individual which is given in the proviso under subsection A of section 164.5A, um, where any individual, if he or she is temporarily or permanently physically or mentally disabled and the magistrate has to take help of the interpreter or the special educator and such recording shall be videographed. So to conclude, section 164 of the CRPC plays a pivotal role in the legal landscape uh, providing a structured framework for the judicial magistrates um, with respect to recording of confessions and statements and it is a procedural safeguard fundamental in maintaining the fairness in criminal investigation. Um, me and my uh, colleague here, we had the opportunity uh, while in training to observe um, the recording of a confession of an accused as well. And all these procedures by the learned judge uh, was followed to the T and uh, it was also videographed. Moving on to custodial death. Um, Meaning of custodial death. 
it means the death of the person while in custody. Um, there's two kinds of custodies, police custody and judicial custody. Police custody is police lockup and judicial custody is prison. Um, the relevant sections is section 176.1a and section 176.5 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Section 176.1a was inserted by the Amendment Act, um, Amendment Act 25 of 2005. Um, according to this subsection, in case of death in custody of the police or any other custody authorized by the court, an inquiry shall be held by the judicial magistrate in addition to the inquiry or investigation held by the police. Inquiry by the judicial magistrate is also mandatory where rape is alleged to have been committed on any woman while she is in the custody of the police or any other custody authorized by the court. So basically, the section can be broken down as the inquiry is parallel to the police investigation into custodial death, rape or disappearance. And the inquiry, uh, it is mandatory that the inquiry shall be done by the judicial magistrate and not the executive magistrate. However, despite the mandatory nature of section 176.1a, there have been a number of custodial deaths and its compliance is highly rare. I think we all know of the case uh, of um, the Benix case which happened during um, lockdown 2020 where uh, the father and son duo were killed while in police custody and the Madras High Court had to uh, see that um, magisterial inquiry uh, was done and basically the Madras High Court had to make a slow motor intervention into this. Um, The guidelines of the National Human Rights um, Commission guidelines are also there, which was followed when we were in training and uh, the, there was a custody of death, but the accused had uh, died in SCNM hospital, but he was, he was not an accused, he was a convict and he had died. So we had the opportunity to go and observe how um, the inquiry is done, um, what is to be written in the report and um, the witnesses that were, the statements that were recorded. So basically, uh, the NHRC guidelines were all followed and it, it, um, the inquiry related to the circumstances of the death, the manner and sequence of incidents leading to the death, the cause of death, uh, and also the statements recorded, the documents examined, the report contained all of this, the discussions, on allegations proved, not proved, and the conclusion that the magistrate arrived at. The NHRC has also set a two-month deadline for the completion of inquiry by magistrate, and general instructions has been um, issued by the NHRC that within 24 hours of occurrence of any custodial death, the commission must be given intimation about it, and uh, there was a, a, a photographer from the CIT branch as well um, uh, when we went to do the, I mean, observe the um, inquiry report um, and direction to video record and photograph autopsy proceedings is also there. So the case laws that uh, relate to this custodial death is DK Basu, as we all know, Prakash Singh, and Arnish Kumar versus State of Bihar, where safeguards have been given by the Supreme Court. Uh, as we have all discussed before, um, that arresting or detaining a person does not lead to the extinction of all the fundamental rights per se. It is the responsibility and the duty of the detaining authority to see that the fundamental rights, especially of personal liberty of the accused or the convict, is not uh, abused and there should be prompt, impartial and effective investigation in case of custodial death. Thank you. Give us this presentation where you have co covered the entire provision of 164 as well as uh, how an inquiry is to be made whenever there is a custodial death. 164 is a part of your almost day-to-day -day activity for a judicial magistrate or a chief judicial magistrate and uh, I think Madam you have explained along with the case laws the applicable case laws that are about how and what are the requirements of 164 and what should be avoided.
And uh, these days, the um, the 164 of a rape victim or under the POXO Act, these are to be recorded as soon as possible and it is the judicial magistrate who normally records and I think it was, all the topics were adequately covered by Ms. Mahima. Uh, one additional information that I'd like to give to you is that um, the Honorable High Court had issued an issued an, uh, a general um, order that within 24 hours of filing the application for 164, the statement has to be recorded. And if, I think, um, yes, this is one particular uh, order of the Honorable High Court, which the learned judicial magistrate and chief judicial magistrate has to keep in mind, uh, otherwise it may entail uh, the uh, things which we, we don't really want to. And apart from 164, uh, what Ms. Mahima has given us uh, um, I think to ponder and to discuss is how custodial, in custodial that how an inquiry is to be made by a magistrate. And she has also given us uh, and told us how she along with her colleague, Mr. Sesehan Subha, had recently observed the proceedings in custodial death, which I believe Ms. Zamyan Chodin had conducted. Right? And this is I think you have had a first-hand experience of how it is to be uh, dealt with. And of course, she said with a lot of clarity, and I think all the magistrates have, you have to keep in mind that certain aspect of the inquiry is necessary. There is no hard and fast rule that these are the criteria, these are the things which you have to uh, do, because we don't have such particular mandate or a guideline from our own Honorable High Court, but yes, there are guidelines of the uh, NHRC, which in almost all type of custodial that these are followed, number one is what are the circumstances of that particular death, you know? What did you see when you went there? What did you observe? What is the cause of death? What are the, who are the witnesses that you have examined? And it is necessary, I think, that when you make an inquiry, you give notice to all the persons that a magistrate thinks that they are related or connected with this particular person. And particularly the, mem the family members. And you have to record their statement and find out <coughs> if there is any fault play. Now, if there is any foul play that you have noticed, you have to record that as well. And not only that, if you feel that there is an involvement of some officer or some person, an authority, either through omission or their commission, then these findings are also to be recorded in your inquiry report. And what is more important is the person who has conducted the post-mortem examination, examine it, see the records, if you are not present there in the, for the post-mortem, examine the other doctors who first saw the uh, dead body, the inquest report, and also the forensic report. This has to be done. And one uh, aspect I think what uh, uh, many of the magistrate, uh, in my experience, is many of us, what we do is uh, we just conclude the report by saying that uh, the custodial, this is a custodial, uh, of course it is a custodial death, but there is no fault blame. This is a, this was suicide, or this was because of this reason or that reason, and there is no fault play at all. Now, 
My personal experience is that uh, we should not make this conclusion so early, because at times it may it may so happen that uh, during the course of postmortem, the the vice <coughs> They send it for forensic examination, toxicology, or whatever it is. There are many reports from the forensic which is awaited. Now, if you make your report then and there saying that there is no foul play, the cause of death is by suicide, then when the forensic report comes, and if there is a forensic report saying that this is because of poisoning, some kind of poison has been found in the um, in the samples that were sent. Now what happens is that our report becomes questionable. So your report will be that what you have observed and if you feel that in your inquiry this is the probable cause of death. You cannot just say that this is the cause of death. So early when, of course, when there is a forensic report awaited or you can see that the final preliminary report you will give it to the NSRC and the authority then and there, but later on, when you give your final report, you give it along with your, if there is a negative finding or a positive finding of the, um, of the forensic report, you give it there. And yes, I would like to uh, invite questions or discussions on custodial debt. Let me clarify one thing, this, uh, at the time of entertaining any from idea of the case I have seen so far, my experience is concerned. With all respect, this uh, learning judicial magistrate is writing in the application on the <coughs> body of the application only, produce on so. Whether this particular uh, this practice is uh, good or uh, learning judicial magistrate, they are required to reflect in proper judicial order. When to examine which particular date is now proper, because they are exciting judicial power. They are not exciting administrative power. For recording what's exposed? <coughs> uh, except on the body of application, I have not seen anywhere reflected. Mm -hmm. Expressing judicial mind, when is the date, proper date for examination of the victim? The second thing, when a record comes, when record containing 164 comes before the, like in FOXO cases, comes before the special court. Lots of questions are being raised by the defense saying that this particular person is not complied. And by virtue of the judgment delivered by the Supreme Court, uh, we nowadays, uh, as for the writing of the Honorable High Court, can call the concerned judicial magistrate for uh, citing as a prosecution witness. But there is a proviso now under section 164, subsection 1. Uh, there is a provision of recording proceeding. If that particular proviso is rightly exercised, there is no question of making so many files against the proceeding being done by the concern next state. <coughs> this will be healthy practice. Another thing is no need to refer, no need to seek any judgment of any court. Our own Honorable High Court student right was in state of seeking. Criminal okay. appeal number 17, and even uh, lots of honorable judges uh, from other states. They are now referring this particular judgment delivered by our own Honorable High Court. Student right was in last time. Justice Asim Rai also now really appreciated this particular judgment delivered by our Honorable High Court. The student right was in state of seeking. In connection 164. Okay. It's very, I think, with all respect, even Honorable High Court, I think I have not seen so far cover those points covering the, this particular judgment. Okay. I mean, they are referring to judicial magistrate. And this uh, custodial death, yes, there is no perfect practice being now invoked by us, especially in learning judicial magistrate, in their own level, intellectual level. So far, Reading the provision of 164. This 164 CRPC is not as per me sufficient to exercise the power of 176 because last time we discussed during the innocent training also. The first thing is 
all of a sudden after getting information, the learning judicial magistrate rushed to the spot without having any equipment, any knowledge, uh, help of the eye of the case, forensic expert, photographer, expert, and preparing the report. All way, using their own caliber. Whether that particular practice is perfect, not examined so far. The first thing is this, when disease was died, the learning judicial message has to rely on the report of the doctor. Doctor will come after us. Or doctor will on request of judicial magistrate only, they will produce the document. Yes, probable cause of that, this particular disease, that is so and so, so and so. So these end number of judgment are there. Learning judicial magistrate taking the experience of doctor has to take the equipment of rector temperature. By using this same to the end of the disease has to determine the probable time of death of the disease. That's Another thing is this, uh, there are step-wise procedure. Last time we discussed, uh, I think, that uh, we, I think, I discussed with uh, Nanitya, madam, or? Yes. Step-wise procedure are there. It's not that all of a sudden you go and exam is not that. That is not perfect procedure so far. My, I think, limited knowledge is not Like examination of post-mortem report, that has to be prepared by the board. Here, the practice is one uh, very senior specialist, Dr. Lecha. Is this you? Half an hour you prepare the report. Don't worry. So, prior to the commission of that particular proceeding of autopsy, the learner must check you the names of relatives. Until and unless relatives, any one of the relatives are present before the commission of post mortem, mm -hmm. uh, can't proceed. Because suppose uh, Hyderabad, hometown of that disease is Hyderabad. Now dead bodies in the STM <coughs> mortuary. You will arrive here almost after 48 hours, 50 hours. By that time, until now, there is direction from not message to keep that particular body in a perfect now temperature. You won't get any evidence. You see, that, that body will be useless. After 40, 80, even in the <coughs> 376 offense, if doctor examine after 40, 80 hours, you won't get any evidence. So this particular thing, I think, is required to keep in mind. Uh, but yes, <coughs> all are intellectual, all are intelligent. But the, what is the perfect procedure now? That has to be, I think, uh, properly prescribed so that there will be uniformity at the time of preparation of one seventy-six CRPC report. Otherwise, uh, sometimes I feel very bizarre. I think all in all, they are going and doing their, uh, this uh, level base to prepare the report without having any this uh, foresight in this dimension. So many information is, I think, required to be gathered. First, you have to inform IOT case, you have to call the forensic, you have to, you have to send the information to jail authority saying that inform to the relatives within so and so hours, you have to this, uh, uh, write a letter to other send information to crime class to bring photographers. All these things has to be reached together. Then you can start. Otherwise, on and on, without having any expert, if you prepare the question may arose, you are not expert. Mm -hmm. This is useless. So many defense will arise. I think I've seen, I've discussed with the uh, judicial magistrate of uh, Delhi also, Karnataka also, Kerala also. They will, I think, doing perfectly they have proper guidelines. No need to worry. And uh, what to say, my is a learning resource person, is experience, 25, 26 experience, keep on preparing when he was a master, CGM also. So one, uh, I think, uh, during the ten, when I was a lawyer, I think, uh, learning resource, quite the inquiry was going on because of the death of Sintam police station. But we were not allowed to go inside the courtroom. Openly in courtroom, that proceeding was going on. 
for examining, so for examination of witnesses is concerned. I don't need procedure at uh, that time. Even today also, too. Whether witness is to be examined by calling in the court or on the spot. On the spot, how many days, under what provision you call. So they have a separate CRPC, they have a specific provision, but we have to rely on the central CRPC. I think uh, this needs to be, I think, really high. But uh, last time we in industrial training, we discussed this matter. We have a lot of knowledge, experience, I think. Whatever report I think comes from your side will be, I think, more, I think, better than with all respect to previous one. Because on and on from their level, they are doing their level this custodial thing. Yes, sir, please. <coughs> sir, the, the director, sir, has given also his thought about the topic that we discussed. Right? And I agree with. Uh, him, that for a matter under 164, we don't need to look any further. Just see the judgment of our own Honorable High Court in Surendra. Yes. State of Sikkim versus Surendra. Surendra. This is criminal appeal number 17 of 2016. This is, I think, of 10th March. It's 2018. 10th yes. March 2018, where the full court, sorry, full bench. Full bench of the Honorable High Court has passed this particular <coughs> judgment. And it not only covers how 164 is to be recorded, or what is the use of 164, but various other aspects of 164, of uh, the provision of 164. And I think this is a must for all of us. We have to go through this particular judgment. And uh, you don't have to go any further, like I said. We will find it in our own High Court. So this is one thing. And uh, another, sir, you have also given us um, a matter to question yes. about whether a custodial inquiry is being done properly or not. So far as I, I am concerned, I think uh, the magistrates here, they are conducting the custodial inquiry in a proper manner, to the best of their ability. Yes. Following the guidelines of uh, the NHRC, yes. and uh, I also, sir, uh, agree with your suggestion that yes, there has to be some mechanism or some guideline to have uniformity in our reports. So for that, I think uh, from the academy or wherever, or from our own individual, uh, we can also request that one particular mechanism could be framed so that all the magistrates could actually follow this particular provision. But we cannot have, we cannot restrict a magistrate, a magistrate to follow only this particular yes. mechanism. Because so that, that would be uh, just a guidelines. Correct. Uh, so this would be one general it, guideline, yeah. but a magistrate can, uh, under the circumstances of a particular case, deal with that particular matter as per the, as per law and as per the situation that has come up. If there is any question, um, we can deal with 164 or 176. Yes. Yeah. Any questions? Anyone to raise here? Anyone to share? Any question? Yes. Madam? Jamil, sir, this, uh, what I now is. Because we work together in so the same court, I've seen, and I'm also requesting to share to sir also whether this produce on social stuff that is sufficient. Sorry. Moment the learned message court receives application from either of the case for examination of victim or accused, just as they will write produce on so and so. Okay. Apart from this. It's not necessary to reflect in the order. Whenever an application is received from an IA for conducting 164 or any other proceeding, this is uh, this is a judicial proceeding, yes. and every judicial proceeding has to be documented. When there is an application, I do not about about the practice of writing it in the, the body of the thing, whatever it is. Normally, what we write is white order sheet. 
means that what is reflected is in the order sheet. In the order sheet, what normally comes is that you have received an application today. What time? You know, it could be in the afternoon, it could be in the evening. So if it is in the morning, if you have uh, sufficient time, with the instructions of the following the instructions of the Honorable High Court, if the witness is present, the victim is present, you record it. If not, you give them time. Follow the procedure, but you have to record it well, in the order sheet. <coughs> the second reason is, uh, suppose that particular victim is now is, uh, physically challenged. The court needs the assistance of expert. The how to issue order to the institution where experts are available. You have to reflect in the order itself. And the moment you ask the order, it <coughs> impliedly understood that you, judicial magistrate apply judicial mind. Correct. A copy of that order goes to the yes. present office yes, yes. for compliance. Compliance. So I would like to say, I don't know about which practice, but then in Gato Court, as well as in Amchi Court, where I call, so everything is written in the order. It has to be, yes. And I think it is done so. I've seen also, yes. in Book of Case 164, so it is reflected in the order sheet yes. as well, but it is also written in the application for the I.O. that <coughs> seen the application that allowed the victim to be produced or uh, guardian to inform the victim, uh, guardian to be informed to produce the victim at such and such date and in sharp or something written. And same is reflected in the order sheet also. And after the 164 is recorded also, the, it is reflected yes, in the order sheet. Be. That is also there. And then with regards to uh, disabled person victim, so what uh, usually it is done is that once the application comes, then interpreter, special educator or interpreter is called. So on that also, the, now I, I recorded one of one statement like that, two statements I think, and in one what I came to know is that there are different types of interpreters also. Some they can understand sign language only, some is for deaf and dumb, some is for, they have their own qualification and this thing. So then once that person is called, he has to produce, a, he or she has to produce a certificate also. Her examination is also conducted. So after that, when the victim's examination is also conducted, so that time, the entire proceeding is recorded. It has to be videographed. Everything has to be videographed and we also have to see victim, if the victim is disabled, what kind of disability the victim has. Absolutely. And they have to give the uh, their certificate also of disability. Some has hearing impairment. Yes, there could be hearing impairment. Some could not. Some, some cannot cannot, speak. Yes. Some has both problems. Yes. And there are situations in which the educator will come and say that I can only understand Absolutely. person who has hearing impairment, but I cannot for one who is deaf and dumb mm -hmm. So for them, the yeah, other special educator has normally to Normally, the problem faces, like all those deaf and dumb people, they are not taught sign languages. Yes. So, so an expert knows sign languages, but cannot understand, they cannot communicate. <coughs> so problem. that is also... That is one problem. So mostly it is uh, that person's uh, own relative who is so better, better relative, able to understand. Relative also, what I have, what I came to know is that you cannot just call any relative who is aware of the facts and circumstances of the case and who is actually involved. Or if you feel that that person also has interest or that person is closely related, so you uh, you will have to call a relative who is familiar with the sign, sign language, but. You have not, to see that that person a, uh, is not a witness or has no vested interest as such or will not get biased. Mm -hmm. So you have to look into that also when the relative is called. So that is how it is done. <coughs> and the victim's uh, uh, statement has to be such that even if it is in sign language also, it has to be, as for Indian Evidence Act, it says, I think 119 of Indian Evidence Act says, in an intelligible manner. So something which we can understand. So that is how we start. And everything has to be recorded. Yes, Even sir. the special educator mm -hmm. also has to be examined first. Mm -hmm. Or the relative also has to be examined yeah. first and the conclusion has to come that, okay, now I feel I'm satisfied that I can record and this person can understand also and it's not going to get influenced. So all the procedure has mm -hmm. to be done. Uh, 
second thing is after recording, the non introducing magistrate will record the statement under 161 64. Uh, that becomes a confidential document. That is not a public document, especially in POPSO Act cases, because uh, whatever statement given there is confined to court and victim only. Uh, that should not be let out to anybody except I of the case with the permission of the special court. Can use it, but the special court I, in n number of judgments says you have to sound the eye of the case saying that this is for the purpose of investigation only. You should not share this information to anybody because there will be high risk to be taken. So then uh, the practice we now invoke in the special court of Mangan was that the statement will come with forwarding letter of the learning judicial magistrate to the special court. Even the basically is not supposed to open. And on that particular day only, until and unless there is an application, requisition from either the case, on the date of examination of victim only, in presence of the special duty, will open that particular envelope with his signature, then will use that particular document at the time of the examination of the victim of POXO. Not before that. So, uh, last time there was a deliberation from uh, Mr. Justice Master for that. The identity should not be here. You get identity in that particular 164 years we made. Should not be shared. So that particular precaution is I think taken to be taken care of by the non domestic Send the statement which in seal envelope with a request to I of the case across to special court for Otherwise, there will be misuse. Then, second time, the reason is very simple. The counseling report and this 164 statement gives uh, different now incentives to proceed ahead with the examination of this uh, examination rest of the case. I of the case after going through the contents, you will examine the witnesses. Mm. And the, you get uh, counseling report also. Counseling report is confidential document that should not be attached with chassis. And what now the practice I have seen so far is counseling on the basis of counseling report, counseling counselors uh, invite these victims. They will teach before examination, before a special court, then they will send to a special court. And mayor or waiter will. <coughs> Deposed before the court. So then the High Court says that counseling report should not be a part of chassis, that is a very confidential document, and it has no evidence in there. And counselor also should not be examined at the time of <coughs> examination of prosecution witness, in, especially in Fox cases. Uh, thank you for the inputs. Uh, that is also important that in uh, cases under the Poxo Act, what is vital is that the identity of the child is not disclosed at any stage, yes. be it investigation, trial, or post. For that, uh, also, we may refer to the case of Robin Barman versus the state of Sikkim of our own Honorable High Court, where there is. Uh, guideline as to how an identity of a child is to be protected in these kind of cases as well. And uh, I think, Madam, you have uh, given this presentation in a manner that I could not have given this uh, on 164 as well as on custodial debt. And I also tell this for Mr. Sese Hang Suba and Ms. Rohini Rai. Your presentation was splendid. And uh, I am here today uh, not as a resource person, but as a, to, to modulate this particular session. We may not call this a training program yes. per se. This is a new method of learning and teaching. 
where the answers have come not from me, not from the director, but from you itself. Yes. Right? And sitting here today, I think I have learned more than all of you. And uh, oh, yeah, please, with this discussion, uh, this vibrant discussion, there are so many topics that have come that we have discussed. We could thrash out many of the problems. And uh, it is said about teaching that if you want to teach, you have to first learn. Yeah. And you, you can be a good teacher if you first learn yourself and without losing your own mind. Yeah. Otherwise, you will not be able to. So, what has happened in this today's session is that all of you you have made your own presentation and for that I'm sure you must have prepared, you have read this provision and the answers have come right from the participants themselves. Thank you sir for, uh, for this kind of new method of, uh, new method of training and this is much more better than me or anybody sitting here and speaking for about two, three hours or four, five hours. This way we can interact, we can remember, and we can also learn by our experiences and by sharing experiences. So on behalf of all of us, we thank you for giving us this opportunity. Now, please formally you close the session.